For 600 years, Africa has lived under the colonial rule of imperialist white power. The European invasion that led to the capture of our land and resources, the enslavement and forced dispersal of our people, has resulted in our centuries-long colonial domination. The colonial slave trade, where African people were turned into commodities for sale, birthed the parasitic economic system of capitalism, which allowed for the once feudal, war-ridden Europe to save itself through the rape and pillage of our Africa and the theft of our labor. For centuries, African people have been forced to live under the most humiliating, inhumane conditions. The atrocities committed against our people since the first Europeans set foot in Africa is impossible to enumerate here. But African people have always struggled against our colonizers to reclaim our dignity, lives, and future as evinced in leaders like Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Harriet Tubman, Nat Turner, Marcus Garvey, and Malcolm X. As recently as the Black Power Movement of the 1960s, we saw African people engaged in the anti-colonial struggle for power in tandem with world struggles being made by Cuba, Kenya, Vietnam, and others. Revolution was the main trend in the world, and the African Revolution was largely recognized as the catalyst that would bring about the total destruction of white power. It was during this height that the U.S. government assaulted our movement with the counterinsurgency, a war without terms that saw our leaders gunned down, thrown into prisons, slandered, and our communities reeling from the imposed crack epidemic. Today, we see the white world driven into chaos through the crisis of this social system. This new period, that can be characterized as the ascendancy of the slave, is seeing the system of colonial capitalism crumbling in rapid fashion. This period was ushered in through the efforts of the African People's Socialist Party, in which the history of the African liberation struggle is concentrated. It was the birth of a revolutionary party of the African working class and the leadership of one Chairman Omali Ishitela that has allowed us to reset the course for African independence. This is relentless. 50 years of leadership toward African redemption. Well, I'm Omale Chatel. I'm chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and leader of the Uhuru Movement. Um, I was really fortunate in so many ways in, as an African at the time that I was born, uh, where uh, everywhere, uh, within the African community, there was discussions of what was happening with black people. You couldn't go to any, any home. And you didn't have to be radical or militant. And, and in fact, most of the people who were talking probably didn't belong to any kinds of organization except their local churches. So uh, there was a deep kind of consciousness about uh, the brutality the, um, imposed on us and, uh, and things like that. And that helped early on to shape my consciousness. In fact, um, I remember an uh, incident in, in high school that contributed to my leaving high school in my senior year uh, was um, uh, really popular and very erudite uh, uh, a professor, a teacher. And uh, I went to him, um, it must have been for something like government, uh, something to that uh, effect. And, and he made the comment in, um, in class that uh, black people would have to prove ourselves to white people before we could be free, something like that. And I challenged him on that. You know, I, I told him I, I completely disagreed, you know, like with that. And, and um, uh, he, he, the other students in the, in the class, you know, jumped to defend uh, the, the professor's or uh, the teacher's uh, statement. And that was, that was significant to me. I, I guess I, I still remember it today. So it was an outstanding thing, but everything was outstanding. I mean, just the, uh, there was no way you could live uh, and not be aware. I, I learned to read when I was very, very young, very small child. And, um, so I read all the time, and that was that's proved to be quite helpful for me. Uh, and um, I, the, the 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 military, U.S. military, was having this campaign about you know, join the army and see the world, that kind of thing. And uh, I felt uh, I was somehow concluded that uh, the limitations that I was experiencing uh, 
in this city uh, as an African had to do with uh, this small city that I lived in and what have you down south, et cetera. So I felt uh, that uh, I would go into the army. And uh, my father admonished me, telling me like it's like, like breaking into jail. He said, you don't want to do that. But I went anyway. And, I'm, and he was right, and I was right. <clears throat> and the thing that made it right for me was quite accidental. Uh, and that I was, uh, I was sent to Berlin, Germany, and uh, got to see part of the world and, and, and people and things like that I never would have seen uh, experienced. I was born and grew up in Florida. So I first faced the first really cold weather of my life in Berlin, in Germany. <clears throat> and I'm, I remember sitting in, this, in these tanks. These are tanks of steel. Uh, uh, and it is freezing. I mean, and I remember, that, but we have the radios and we could listen uh, to the radios. And <clears throat> this woman um, uh, from uh, the Soviet Union or, uh, or, or from uh, Eastern uh, Germany, uh, speaking English over the radio. They had radio programs, you know, and we listened to it because they had good music. And I never forget this woman saying something to the effect that this next song you're going to hear is called Peace Down Earth by Louis Armstrong, Peace Down South by Louis Armstrong. But of course, there has been no peace down south for such and such a period. And she, I, I never forget that she dropped that gem right there. And then the civil rights movement is heating up in the United States while I'm there. So that informed me a lot. And anyway, I ended up. Uh, uh, being sent back to uh, uh, to Georgia, I left Germany, uh, being sent to Georgia, and had all kinds of. By now, I'm I'm an angry. I'm extremely angry because I'm aware of what's happening to us. And I get to Georgia, this this base, and I see these Africans. They would go to town uh, on passes and what have you. Come back all bloodied, beaten up, and what have you, because of of what white people were doing to them in that, in those places and. And uh, other stuff was happening throughout Georgia, you know, so-called civil rights movement and uh, et cetera. Shortly after the chairman was discharged from the military, events continued to unfold throughout the world, radicalizing him in the process. It wasn't long after that chairman contacted the headquarters of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. He established the first membership-based SNCC organization in Florida. It was as a member of SNCC that the famous mural struggle on December 29, 1966 occurred. An eight by 10 foot white nationalist mural that hung in the St. Pete City Hall government building was torn down by the chairman. This first act of black power was the precursor to the Black Panther Party storming the California State Capitol building on May 2nd, 1967. And so we, we started demonstrating uh, around the mural. We would start off in the African community and walk downtown, and we would do that on several occasions. And then on this one day, uh, December 29th, uh, uh, we uh, were marching through the African community, and this older woman, uh, she uh, you know, quickly threw on a robe and some, and some house shoes and joined the march. She wanted to wait for her. Uh, and um, so when we got down to the city hall and we're standing up on the steps of city hall, speaking from that platform, uh, the sister, this woman, when she started talking, she was complaining about how insurance companies, this was typical, would take African money, Africans money for years and then something happened and then there was no money. So that's, this was her complaint. And as she was standing there talking and uh, uh, her English wasn't that good and what have you. And the white cops and reporters who were standing in front, they started laughing at her. And uh, that infuriated me. That really infuriated me. So I, uh, we had not planned to take that mural down then. We had talked about how it could be done in a very embarrassing way for them because we said we can put on some coveralls and stuff like that and, uh, and things like that and put a rag in their back pocket and walk in there with a ladder and some boards and we can go there and take it down in public view. Nobody would have thought anything because that's what black people are supposed to be doing, right? So, uh, <clears throat> so we had talked about that, uh, but we had not planned to take that mural down that day. This is an eight by 10 foot 
uh, <clears throat> mural that's been on the wall for 30 years or so. And uh, we had written letters about the mural uh, to the mayor and uh, <laughs> Herman Goldner. Yeah. So uh, we had we had complained about it, and you know he had sent most ridiculous kinds of comments, just the most arrogant kind of white nationalist comment, comments. So when the woman did that, I turned to my heel and I walked into the uh, into the city hall, <clears throat> and Jody Wall, who was 17 at the time, he 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 followed me in, and I started looking for a place that uh, that that mural could be taken from the wall, and I found a little place, and I ripped it down. It sounded like a roar in, the, in this city hall thing. And uh, um, and we marched out. Anyway, they arrested us and um, they uh, charged us, charged me with 11 different offenses and they gave others, you know, a serious a number of offenses. And their objective was to make sure that they got us on as much as they could. Uh, and uh, they would have uh, courts at uh, something like eight, nine o'clock at night. You know, we've been dragging to courts and things like that. Extraordinary process. And because they were afraid, uh, they were afraid because uh, the cop who arrested me, he was literally trembling when he grabbed my arm. He was trembling because this was a new breed of African. They had never run into this before. And we were talking about black power, et cetera. And they knew we had no regard at all for them. And uh, uh, so, so they jailed uh, us, jailed me. I went to, uh, they, they, they charged me, uh, like I said, with 11 different offenses. And then uh, they sent me to prison uh, on the felony uh, for grand larceny. And, uh, uh, and that was uh, a trip, you know, believe me. The struggle was on during this period activists were consistently attacked and thrown in jail, including Chairman Amalia Shetela. Despite their attempts to stifle the chairman's leadership, in 1968, the chairman formed the Junta of Militant Organizations, or JOMO, and published the Burning Spear newspaper. Chairman organized all throughout the state of Florida, and JOMO became a formidable black power organization within the U.S. My name is Chimaringa C. Lambao. I'm the National Director of Organization for the African People's Socialist Party. Uh, that's a good question. I was in Joba. I was uh, 17 years old, and I was recruited by Chairman Omali Shitela, who happened to be my oldest brother. So um, I guess I had a it was sort of a genes thing. Uh, so uh, other members of my family were politically active as well. He recruited several other members of, of our family. Um, so at the time I was in high school, I was in my senior year in high school, going into my senior year. This was the summer of 1968. Uh, so in the middle of uh, the summer, in August of 1968, there was a sanitation worker strike. So Jomo was kind of built off of that sanitation worker strike. So the chairman, other members of Jomo would get at the tail end of the demonstrations that were held, happening on a daily basis in support of, yeah, I should say that the whole African community supported the sanitation workers, which were almost all black. <clears throat> so, Every day, there would be marches in support of the sanitation workers. So Jomo would get at the tail end of these marches, and at some point, uh, we might even veer off and go in another direction. <laughs> but, but we would take part of it, and then it would go the other way with the other part of it. Uh, it was being led by a man named Joe Savage, who was uh, sort of the elder person in, in the sanitation workers. But they had some very uh, young militant members of uh, the sanitation workers. One of them was Fred Winters. But that is how that that motion and activity uh, was also in the aftermath of 
murdered that Martin Luther King um, that April earlier, some months earlier. So the, the, it was a tense situation all over the United States for African people in the first place. And then this was a perfect set of political circumstances for the building of the Hunter Militant Organizations. In the height of the counterinsurgency, Chairman O'Malley and Jomo continued to organize throughout the state of Florida and the South, establishing branches, holding Uhuru festivals, leading struggles to free our political prisoners, continuing publication and distribution of the Burning Spear newspaper, all the while summing up the world situation through the point of view of the African working class. It was through these organizing efforts that Chairman Met Couture Carey, founder of the Gainesville Black Study Group, and Lawrence Mann, founder of the Black Rights Fighters in Fort Myers, Florida. All three organizations will come together to consolidate the African People's Socialist Party on African Liberation Day in May of 1972. The party in its infancy had assumed a major task to solve the outstanding problems of the Black Revolution. Solving the problems consisted of identifying the fundamental one plaguing African people throughout the world. This led to the chairman publishing Colonialism, the major problem confronting African people in the U.S. This document was groundbreaking. Colonialism being asserted as the primary contradiction provided our struggle with coherence and a to what end. Identifying colonialism as the core presented struggles within different political sectors of the African liberation movement. The conclusions that the party would come to based on our understanding of colonialism were not universally agreed upon conclusions. Nevertheless, the party did not surrender to the opportunists, the imperialist white left. We fought relentlessly and that every opportunity struggled principally as to advance the understandings throughout our movement. This understanding would lay the foundation for African internationalism. I think it was really in the 1960s where we began to see uh, more Africans who were involved in struggle, able to identify the struggle of African people in the United States as colonialism. I think that was a major thing that we have begun, and we were, if you look through that period of time and read the different stuff that I was writing and that we were writing about, you can see you know, that there were elements of, uh, of uh, confusion around certain questions, but we were constantly zeroing in, you know, looking at it, um, at the question, stripping it, examining it, you know, uh, et cetera, and, and moving with it. The colonial question was critical. Defining this colonialism, that's, <clears throat> that's like the ultimate issue because you cannot fight against colonialism and still be an American. You, you can't hang on to America in fighting against colonialism. I think even some of the most ardent black communists, black nationalists and what have you, I think that's part of even what the five state thing is, not wanting to give up some version of American Americanism. And uh, so the colonial question was, uh, was spoke with finality. You can end this relationship, that's what it is. Uh, uh, and the colonial question became extremely important. And this whole thing about, you know, fighting against racism and colonialism is just uh, like being an African American. It's just trying to hang on uh, to this uh, uh, America. To fight against racism is to improve America. And uh, why would you want to improve uh, this system of oppression? Colonialism, as the fundamental problem, placed another outstanding question into its proper context. What to do with the white people? Up to this period, this question was answered with philosophical idealist conclusions, relegating white people to mutants, monsters, and devils. This explanation did nothing to help us understand how we as African people are going to win our freedom. It was African internationalism that declared white people are people too and they have a responsibility to the African Revolution under the leadership of the African working class. This understanding led to the founding of the African People's Solidarity Committee, the party-led organization of white people working in the interests of the African Revolution. 
While the white left were busy withdrawing their support and turning against the black power movement, APSC would be the vehicle we used to draw the line in the sand. We drove the struggle directly into the belly of the beast, the colonizer population. In the beginning, some of the primary work of APSC was to bring resources back to the African Revolution, holding various types of fundraisers that would set the foundation for many of our economic institutions. They gathered resources from their own colonizer population in support of major party campaigns, such as the struggle to free Desi Woods. This was a bold advancement that the party fought to win. Now, the brilliant strategy behind APSC and its mass organization, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, further evinces the correctness of our position. I uh, just want to say that I think that the, the history of the African People's Socialist Party is really critical for the world to know. And the founding of the African People's Solidarity Committee was part, a very important part, of Chairman O'Malley to tell us solving the problems left to him unresolved from the African, the defeat of the African Revolution of the 1960s. And, and one of them was what to do about the white people. How should, what should the African Revolution's relationship to white people be? So the founding of the African People's Solidarity Committee, which took place in St. Petersburg, Florida in 19, 76 was incredibly historic. You know, the chairman laid out that they were building a cadre organization, more than a mass organization, a cadre organization to, for political and material support for the party and for the African Revolution. And, um, a, you know, a number of people signed up for it, but it was very short-lived with that. And, and, and it took the party until 1985, almost 10 years really, to consolidate and win those of us who were members of the African People's Solidarity Committee to really become African internationalists and unite with the leadership of the African Revolution as our revolution, as this is that we could come to the same conclusions. Perhaps one of the most profound party-led campaigns, the struggle to free Desi Woods smash colonial violence, allowed us to raise up the colonial question and negate the ideological influence of the imperialist white left. During this period, we would meet Omowali K. Fing, a revolutionary giant and member of the party. He was a central organizing force, working alongside 19-year-old Demisha Black Earth, leader of the National Committee to Defend Desi Woods. The case surrounded Woods, an African woman who was sentenced to 22 years in prison for successfully defending herself and friend Cheryl Todd against a colonial rape attempt by a white man in 1975. This campaign had worldwide support as the committee to defend Desi Woods toured internationally. We held countless demonstrations throughout the US, including the first demonstration to ever happen inside Plains, Georgia, the hometown of James Earl Carter. U.S. president sitting during the time of this campaign. The slogan to smash colonial violence became a dividing line. The opportunism of the white left was expressing itself in a profound way, as they attempted to make the primary issue one based on women's rights. We were told it would be easier to make this a feminist issue, but we held firm, and after intense struggle made by the people, in 1981, Desi X. Woods was a free woman. During this time, where the party was receiving support and participation from all over. The party organized the African National Prison Organization, a mass organization that brought Africans back into political life with the question of political prisoners. The work to build the party was transforming. The chairman presented the political aspects to building a mass movement, the tactical and strategic objectives for black liberation in 1977 at a black organizers conference at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. This presentation, published in the pages of the Burning Spear newspaper, was widely studied throughout the African liberation movement and would inform the way in which we do work going forward. When the party came out and said smash colonial violence, that was it because that 
made you have to reckon with the state and if you know it's the state doing it, not some far off idea in somebody's head called racism, then you know that if you're in solidarity, you are choosing to be in solidarity with the African working class and oppressed peoples of the world. And you know you can't hide. You can't hide out anymore. You're gonna really you're gonna really acknowledge it because if it's colonialism, we're a part of it. Colonialism cannot exist on its own. I mean, you can have bad ideas, racist ideas about someone. It does not connect you to them in any way. But when it's colonialism, there has to be a colonizer and a colonized. And that's, that is the ultimate truth that really is what organizes one in a principled relationship with the African working class, the African revolution. Oakland, California had been a hotbed for African revolution due to it being the birthplace of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. In many ways, it had been the center of the Black Power movement, and with our work surrounding the Desi Woods campaign and building the Solidarity Front, the party would bring the movement back to life in this city. For 12 years in the 1980s and early 90s, Oakland was the national headquarters of our party. We would conduct our party's first Congress in Oakland in 1981. The party intervened in countless struggles, especially in regards to housing, homelessness, and rent control. In 1984, we led the Community Control of Housing Initiative, known as Measure O, which organized numerous volunteers who delivered more than 300,000 flyers to the doorsteps of Oakland residents, which resulted in winning 29,000 votes on the ballot. Our fierce struggles resulted in the takeover of an abandoned house in East Oakland for a homeless family, a generation before the rise of the Occupy movement. We fought the slumlords every step of the way while bringing the African community of Oakland back into political life. The party conducted the second historical Freedom Summer Project, and in a short time, we built a movement and opened the Uhuru House on MacArthur Boulevard. Huey P. Newton, chairman of the Black Panther Party, made his last speeches at the Uhuru House, passing the torch to the APSP after stating, It was the party who, following Newton's assassination in 1989, led a major campaign to change the narrative around Huey. After the media slandered him, all of their headlines reading from prime minister to bum. The party declared that we would change those headlines by the time Huey's funeral came. We waged a scorched earth campaign, covering every surface with images and slogans extolling Huey. We also played a huge role in organizing his funeral, having even printed the program. Huey was right. The Black Revolution still had a pulse. Along with our Huru House, we would develop more community programs like the Bobby Hutton Freedom Clinic, Uhuru Bakery and Cafe, Spear Graphics, Uhuru Foods and Pies, Uhuru Furniture, and more. We would recruit Bakri Olatunji, one of the leading members of our party today. We would see a powerful leader in the form of Biko Lumumba and develop a fraternal relationship with Unión do Barrio, the Mexican Liberation Organization. In addition, we raised Lavelle Mixon up as an African martyr, defining this issue for our community after he killed four Oakland cops in March of 2009 in an act of African resistance. It has been the party's history in Oakland that has sustained the African community's revolutionary fervor through countless forums, campaigns, marches, and more. Today, the demand for reparations is being hotly debated. Case studies are being done by institutions as a means to legitimize reparations to African people in the U.S. The same forces who were vocally opposed to the demand are now proposing various types of reform or poverty programs as reparations. But why are they discussing this now? 
It's because the party determined that we would make reparations a household word over 40 years ago. In 1981, the party revised and adopted our 14-point working platform, with point number 11 being, we want the U.S. and the international European ruling class and states to pay Africa and African people for the centuries of genocide, oppression, and enslavement of our people. We took this demand to the streets to be embraced by the African masses. In 1982, the party held the first of 12 consecutive world tribunals in Brooklyn, New York, where Chairman Amalia Shetela served as the people's advocate. The proceedings of this tribunal employed the use of international law to prove our case and indict the U.S. on the crime of genocide against African people. The first tribunal featured testimonials from different sectors of the African nation, raising up the crime of genocide as it related to education, poverty, health care, prisons, and more. Among the speakers was Comrade Mafundi Lake, political prisoner in the state of Alabama, Afani Shakur, former member of the Black Panther Party and mother of Tupac Shakur. In our work to build for the first tribunal, we met fierce revolutionary Gaida Cambon and built the African National Reparations Organization. The consecutive tribunals would take place throughout the U.S. They would gain news coverage and interests of Africans from all over. This was not the extent of our reparations work, however. During the Reagan administration and the threat of government assistance cutbacks, the party raised the slogans, they say cutback, we say payback, reparations now, and food stamps hell, reparations now. The responsibility of APSC began to expand, fight for reparations to the African revolution, organize among the colonizer population for reparations to the party's self-determination programs. We, uh, as the party built the tribunal on reparations to African people, the initial tribunal was in Brooklyn, New York in 1982. That was another chapter, you know, but that was all connected to the same period. But um, the, just the party taking on, raising up the demand, a mass demand in the African working class for reparations to African people as a revolutionary demand. And, you know, something that no, none of the African petty bourgeoisie or white left would support that at all at that time. The African People's Socialist Party is regarded as 21st century Garveyites. Marcus Garvey organized 11 million Africans into the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League, raising up the slogan, Africa for Africans, at home and abroad, in recognition that we are one African people. African fundamentalism, the worldview that informed the Garvey movement, has been advanced through the leadership and work of Chairman Omali Ishitela into African internationalism. African internationalism brought us to the same conclusion, that we are one African people, and our task is to unite and organize the entire globally dispersed African nation under the leadership of a revolutionary party of the African working class. That is why, at the party's first Congress in 1981, it was resolved to build the African Socialist International. 50 years of African People's Socialist Party leadership has transformed the African National Liberation Movement. When you think of the, uh, the work the chairman has produced in terms of theory, uh, because until that moment, when you talked about revolutionary theory, for national liberation, for world socialism. You have to look into Lenin and Mao and others. Uh, but when you look at the work the chairman has produced, you see the intensity, uh, the depthness, you know, uh, just, the, you know, of uh, the scientific worldview that uh, he has developed uh, and which uh, basically is now in the hands of the African working class is just historical. It's just like a uh, uh, earthquake you know, uh, you know, that basically shakes everything, changes everything. Uh, what we have done just to to connect Africans uh, from everywhere, uh, from London, we were able to to go everywhere. Uh, when you think in the, in the year 2000, you know, in the 90s, you know, we went, we searched, and that was before the first SI conference in 1999. We contacted every organization we heard of, 
uh, particularly between 1995 and 1999. Uh, and uh, sometimes with success, like the Ivory Coast, uh, uh, Comrade at the time. Uh, so we made different groups. Uh, they, there is no group that we didn't reach, uh, you know, if we believe there was a potential to win them to, to the ASI. And we could do that because we were armed with African internationalism. You know, the correctness of that philosophy just gives you the authority to go anywhere. And uh, you know, engage with any organization. Uh, you feel that you should win them to to the other side. In fact, every time we went somewhere, we were breaking new grounds. Like for example, when we went to France, Belgium, Germany, and so on, uh, we did the ALD. Uh, in the first one in 2012, people, you know, the African people don't really do ALD in Paris. Uh, we introduced it there. Uh, not only we introduce ALD, we introduce also a newspaper, you know, a uh, working class newspaper, a revolutionary working class newspaper. For example, this is the first uh, bilingual. We had, uh, for the first ALD, you can see it's say April or May 2012. You know, that is in French, you know, Expression des Familles Africaines à la Courneuve. So we gave voice to the African working class being expelled uh, by uh, the French uh, uh, state, you know, defending the African working class right to decent housing, you know. Uh, so, and when you flip the newspaper, you get the English side, you know, uh, basically half is English, half is French. So that's new ground because the African working class never had a newspaper of its own uh, anywhere until a burning spear, you know, uh, was given to them. And we went to Germany. Uh, we had meetings in Frankfurt, we had meetings in Berlin, we had meetings in Wuppertal, and now all these places we introduced Africans to the new uh, evangelism, you know, revolutionary evangelism for the African nation. That if you unite with this uh, thinking, if you put this in practice, you will definitely build a new African nation. Uh, Our work extended throughout Africa, Europe, and the Caribbean, recruiting party members and building organization on the ground establishing our influence and worldview in every place we touched. That they believe in united Africa, where all Africans will come together and be able to join the Olympics of one Africa. Yes. How can they then go to the ASC, who says that Africa belongs to all who live here? party's founding. Chairman Amalia Chatella recognized that the African Revolution was inherently connected to liberation struggles happening around the world. We demonstrated this by participating in the Puerto Rican Socialist Party influenced Bicentennial Without Colonies in 1976, holding demonstrations in solidarity with the struggle of Iranian peoples starting in 1979, speaking at a conference in solidarity with the FSLN government of Nicaragua representing the African nation in 1981. In our work to build the African Socialist International, we conducted a tour to France and England in 1983 and met with the Irish Republican Socialist Party in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Shortly after the chairman's visit, their headquarters was burned down and their leader assassinated. In 2015, 
The chairman would represent Africa at the Dialogue of Nations conference held in Moscow, Russia. The chairman has taken African internationalism everywhere. And just as Ho Chi Minh looked to Garvey, it became increasingly clear that the African Revolution will free up all of humanity. Through our work building the African National Prisons Organization and the African National Reparations Organization, we had established the basis for mass organizing. However, in 1991, the party founded the National People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, later to become the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement, MPDEM, in Chicago, Illinois, the place where former Black Panther Party leader Fred Hampton had been assassinated. MPDEM was founded to bring the African masses back into political life, as well as recruit a reserve pool of forces to bring into the party. Through Impedum, we have waged many anti-colonial campaigns to defend the democratic rights of the African community. The first president of Impedum was Nkura Njeri, the widow of Fred Hampton and mother of Fred Hampton Jr., who the party defended after being stuck with an 18-year prison sentence for a framed-up arson charge. Perhaps one of the most historic struggles involving Impedum was the pitched battle between the African community and the colonial state in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1996. The St. Pete police murdered 18-year-old Tyron Lewis on October 24, 1996. The aftermath led to two intense battles and a city forever changed. This struggle was known as the Battle of St. Pete. So the Battle of St. Pete. Whew. Now see, that was like interesting times. And I say interesting because, you know, I had never ex experienced rebellion. You know, I know St. Pete has a history of, of rebellion, you know, and and the, and the fact that the party is the, is the reason why the people, are, you know, have the, you know, a connection and understanding the, the, the material relationship that, uh, you know, that we have with this system. And people can identify, you know, where the problem's at, you know. And the Battle of St. Pete, it's crazy because um, <laughs> it was uh, October 24th is when Tyron Lewis was murdered. And I wasn't on the scene then, um, but I found out about it. It's was, it was crazy. Well, I had a baby, and she was born on the 22nd. So I was in a, in a rough situation as far as relationships-wise, but I was totally oblivious to what was happening because I, cause I lived, I, had, I was living like... 6th Avenue North may have been and 33rd Street and like I said I was having a rocky relationship situation I had a, had a newborn child born on the 22nd and on the 24th that evening after she was uh, before she was sent home from the hospital um, I went to it was on 34th Street and 5th Avenue North at the gas station I think it was a Chevron at the time and I went to use uh, the phone and you know the pay phone and I saw these cops you know it was probably about three of them or so, and they were in full riot gear. You know, I don't know what's going on. So I pull up, use the, you know, the pay phone, and they cursing me out, telling me to get on by my way. I'm like, what is your problem? Like, Why y'all dressed like that? You know, you look kind of foolish. And so one of them was like, oh, he don't know. Okay. So, you know, I made my way back to, to you know, back to the south side, um, to the house that I was, um, that I had moved to. It said right on um uh, Tyrone Lewis Avenue, formerly, formerly 18th Avenue South, and when I got to the, got, got, I got to the South Side, you saw it was nighttime. It, it, had, it, had, it had reached night at that time, and you saw like in the horizon, it's like blazes. It was like luminous light, <laughs> you know, red. It was yellow. It was. I'm looking. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So I jump in that six five and pile out here and hit down the road. One significant event when um, they had, when the pigs attacked um, the Uhura House, um, and I think in the paper they said they unloaded, they, they unloaded uh, all the, the tear gas canisters they had in, in, in the city of St. Pete. And that's a lot. And when they when they um, discharge those um, those canisters, they they're on fire when they discharge. And I, the 
it was an MP Dunn meeting on the 13th of Wednesday. And I was a little late getting there. Um, I was working at a at a at a, at a group home, and right in Coke and the Key. So I'm, I'm I'm loading the boys up in the van. So I'm like, you know, I got to get to this meeting. So <laughs> we get there, the roads are blocked off, you know, and and I see the commotion. I see the police shooting this tear gas and stuff at you know at the building at cars, and there's a lot of smoke and you see fire. Um, and they were like de uh, deliberately shooting tear gas at the trees to set the trees on fire. So I was able to maneuver the van through the community and get out and we ran up, ran up. So um, um, I, I, I took a water hose from the back and just started immediately trying to put the, um, put the, put the fires out that, that they started. And, and it, was, it, was, it was crazy. And I, and I looked and I saw the side door bust open and people trying to get out and they're shooting tear gas at people like they were trying to kill people you know no joke they were trying to kill people and when I say when you're grounded in the community and there there's this uh, you know and the fact that that the, the movement has been has been here so long the people understand who they need to protect and when I say I look to my right and it felt like an army of young people rushing down the road and they identify what we identify later as ghost face <laughs> they put the t-shirts around their, around their, 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 their faces and when I say they protected and saved lives this community did that protecting and save lives and whatever ammunition they had they unloaded them and you saw you saw the same people least they fell back now you heard them saying fall back fall back <laughs> they on a heavy fight they were they were. Uh, tear gas starts coming through the front door. And now it's a panic, a total panic. People are, are scrambling, so we lead them into the back room of the whorehouse, which is actually a gym at the time. Uh, a whore's gym of my own, black gym of my own. So that door separated the main hall from the gym. So we're getting people to come back in the back as the room, as this room is filling up with tear gas. And as a matter of fact, I remember Pop Lancaster took some pictures of the tear gas boom, boom, starting to fill. I had a very uh, pivotal moment as I coughed from the tear gas in the back. I remember very vividly, I mean, people are coughing, trying to recover from the tear gas, and the chairman very calmly looked at me, and he says, St. Pete will never be the same if we survive. And I remember thinking, that's not a very reassuring statement. Today, in PDEM is headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri, following the party's building efforts since the Ferguson Rebellions of 2014. Columbia and Danette was appointed as the president, and under her leadership, we've seen Impedum grow its international presence, advance major campaigns like Africans Charge Genocide, Black Community Control of the Police, and more. 2021 marked 30 years of existence for the organization. In 2015, the party also consolidated the African National Women's Organization, or ANWO, to open up our mass front by explicitly organizing African working class women whose significance in shaping the future has ordinarily been undermined through backwards ideas. We also found ANWO to be strategic to challenge the bourgeois ideology of feminism, to instead arm African working class women with their own theory. ANWO is an international organization that has built a presence throughout the U.S., in Europe, and Africa, and is led by President Yedide Orunila. The variety offered through our mass organizing efforts has resulted in the party's incalculable reach. Our party is well known for our beloved economic institutions. 
Today, scores of shoppers patronize our furniture stores in Oakland, California, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Many vendors and customers alike look forward to our One Africa, One Nation markets or our Holiday Uhuru Pies campaigns. The Uhuru movement today has over 50 economic institutions and programs, bringing economic self-reliance to the work of the party and establishing dual and contending power to negate the influence of colonial capitalism. The chairman introduced the concept of dual and contending power to the world, and it has characterized all of our economic development initiatives. Our oldest institution to date is the Burning Spear newspaper, in print for 53 years. The reparations fundraisers transformed into the institution well known as Uhuru Foods and Pies, based in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Oakland, California. Following the 1985 move bombing, the party went into Philly under the slogan, Reinforcements are on the way. This history of struggle helps to show we have fought tooth and nail for everything we've built. Through fierce battles, we established Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles, an institution of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. Today, located at 832 North Broad Street, this institution has spin-off businesses like Enzo, African Styles at Home and Abroad, and recently, Uhuru on the Move. We also built the One Africa, One Nation flea markets, health festivals, book fairs, all of which have been responsible for employing hundreds of African vendors. Through the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, or APDEP, African Skills for African Liberation, the party opened up a new front to access scientists, doctors, and the like, to win them to turn their skills over to the African nation. Headquartered in Huntsville, Alabama, and under the leadership of Dr. Aisha Fields, APDEP has paved the way in African independent agriculture with our community gardens in Huntsville and Houston, our disaster relief program, Project Black Ankh, was developed to negate the colonial Red Cross. We traveled to Sierra Leone during the Ebola crisis, built a maternal health clinic that helped to safely deliver 300 African babies, and in the last several years, APDEP has provided the African internationalist response to the colonial virus, COVID-19. The economic work is led by Deputy Chair Ona Zanei Shetela, upon whose arrival represented a new era in party building. The work under DC Ona's leadership saw the rapid development and professionalism of our institutions and practices within the party. She instituted manuals and plans of actions, reporting processes, and in 2017, she developed the dynamic recruitment program known as the NTU Volunteer Brigade. She advanced the nonprofit sector of our movement through the African People's Education and Defense Fund and forged Black Star Industries, a longtime vision of the chairman, reflective of Garvey's Black Star Steamship Line and other economic initiatives that sought to free up African workers from the traps of colonial capitalism. Just as we did in Philly in the 80s and 90s, DC Ona went into St. Louis, Missouri and began work building the Black Power Blueprint Project. In the heart of the African working class community, we now have our Uhuru House Community Center, our Gary Brooks Community Garden, and One Africa, One Nation Market, our towering red, black, and green flag, housing for our African Independence Workforce Program, with a community basketball court, African Women's Health Center, and Bakery Cafe on the way. Within the last several years, we've also introduced the Buy Black Power campaign that allows for African business owners to connect, buy, and sell to one another as part of a conscious mission to economically empower the African community. This by no means is an exhaustive list of our work in this area. Our economic work has not solely been for the purposes of sustaining the African revolution. It is a part of the anti-colonial struggle to overthrow the system of colonial capitalism and lay the ground for an independent African economy. In 2008, with the selection of Barack Hussein Obama for U.S. President, the party initiated the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations, uniting African organizations to a basic set of principles. 
This formation helped to expose that the election of Obama represented the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s. Through this coalition, we have demystified neocolonialism or white power in Black faiths. We hold annual marches on the White House, bringing the demands of the African working class to the center of the so-called progressive anti-fascist movement. In 2015, the party held the Black People's Grand Jury to indict Darren Wilson with the murder of 18-year-old Mike Brown. During the rebellions, chairmen took to the streets of Ferguson, marching with the people and politicizing the situation at hand. Place else is because of young Africans right here in Ferguson who stood up. Yeah. 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 I don't. I don't want to hear any criticism of these young Africans. No. 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 It is. It is because these young people stood up and they fought. They fought back like you're supposed to fight when you are occupied, when your community is occupied, and they're shooting you down in the streets. What you are supposed to fight Throughout our party's history, we have utilized the electoral arena as a means to build a mass movement, raising the demands of our community. In 2017, the party ran candidates in St. Petersburg, Florida, on a platform of reparations, gaining national coverage, including a profile in Ebony Magazine. In 2021, we ran impedum President Columbai and Danette for Alderwoman in St. Louis under the slogan, Revolutionary Times, Revolutionary Solutions, going up against a dynasty of neo-colonialists. In 2019, Chairman Amalia Chatello represented the African nation at Oxford, debating the question of whether or not there should be a closer African union. The chairman's position received resounding applause as he was the clear winner. We have to be able to break out of this, but it's going to take revolution in order to do this. African revolution in order to do this. African revolution that will destroy imperialism and the world economy that's responsible for the growing immiseration of the masses of people around the world, Uhuru. And it doesn't stop there. The party continues to build, seizing new territory, leaving no arena uncontested. We've ushered in a new period of struggle and cadre members of our movement are being forged like steel. Uh, but the key thing is going to be whether Africans, we, assume responsibility for our future <clears throat> and assume responsibility uh, 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 for the future. And, uh, and Africa is critical to the future because here's where uh, the, the real communism is going to come about. Is because uh, the, the colonial mode of production built into itself the, its own disaster. It has uh, dispersed Africans all around the world. Every place we are located in Africa and other places central uh, to the production, the capitalist production as such. That means that organized, uh, ideologically uh, uh, informed, uh, with the revolutionary theory and what have you, with the revolutionary party, uh, then Africa and African people have the ability to bring the entire thing down and to grow a new world. Uh, that's truly not primitive communism, but the real McCoy as a consequence of the, those us, of us who function as the pedestal of this entire thing uh, uh, get, get the power over our own lives, over the uh, productive processes uh, of the world and create a whole new mode of production. And, and so that's uh, what, what I think these 50 years uh, contributes to that we've been involved in uh, up to now. But only we uh, can we, we hold the, 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 the winning hand uh, if we take advantage of who we are, where we're located in the world, the revolutionary theory that we produce, the revolutionary organization that we've created, uh, and, and this history of, uh, of this, this, this history of unending uh, struggle, this of, of our party that's representative of the history of our people, the relentless struggle for 50 years for the redemption of Africa, not 
<clears throat> for the, the freedom of some barbecue stand in, in the south of the United States, but for the redemption of Africa. It's our time. Uhuru.